I am honored to be before you and to serve alongside with you. Today we're going to talk about some important things. I want you to know that each and every man in here should, at least, and I believe do, have courage. Amen. And there's nothing wrong with courage, amen? amen? We're in a room full of men, so there's testosterone, yes, a necessary component for every man. Yes, right, courage and testosterone. Yes, and while these two are very important, it is not most important. As men of God, we need the Holy Ghost. Yes, sir. Let's go to Acts. As you well know, we have, we are branded here at NC 3rd. We are known as Acts 6 and 3 men. That's who we are. This is what we strive to be. And the Bible reads, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you. For seven men of honest report. Full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. In verse 5, it then says, And the same pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. Let's also look at Acts 7. Acts chapter 7, verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. And they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, Stephen, the same Stephen I just read about, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Kind Father, in the name of Jesus, have thine own way. Not my will, but thy will be done. Touch these lips of clay. Allow me to speak with clarity and articulate the message that you have given me. Hide me behind the cross so that they only see you. It is my sincere prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Stephen, full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and he saw the glory of God and he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Stephen, my brothers, was our kind of guy. He was a wood knight, if you will. He was a NC third kind of man. He was a man that had courage and clearly had testosterone. Please indulge me. What is the definition of courage? I don't mean to insult anybody's intelligence. But courage is the mental or moral strength to venture. Venture means to proceed, especially in the face of danger. To persevere and to withstand danger fear, or difficulty. I want you to know if you're in the safety of your home and you're talking big and bad, that's not courage. You're in the confines of safety. The adversary or foe that you want to speak noise about is not present. But when they're in your face, do you have the courage? Do you have the convictions of your courage, to stand the courage, excuse me, of your convictions to say what needs to be said. What are some of the synonyms? I enjoy looking at synonyms because if there's any breakdown in understanding the definition, it allows someone to perhaps grab hold to another word to help them comprehend and understand the point I'm trying to make. What is a synonym for courage? Things come to mind like bravery, courageousness, daring, Fearlessness, gallantry, great heartedness, guts, heart, heroism, 
intestinal fortitude, yes, moxie, nerve, your prowess, valor, or virtue. I'm talking about courage. You have to choose the right synonym for courage. Courage is like metal. You've heard that you need to test your metal. Sometimes spirit or resolution comes into play, and it'll make sense in a minute. Tenacity means mental or moral strength to resist opposition. Uh, courage implies that there's a firmness of mind and the will to face danger or extreme difficulty. The courage to support an unpopular cause. I can't get no help in here. Punks and sissies everywhere saying there's nothing wrong with a man marrying a man or a woman being with a woman. Well, my courage says in the face of adversity, the devil is a lie. God is true and make every man a lie. God made man and female, male and female. I can't get no help in here. I'm here to tell you in the face of unpopular causes, Courage must manifest itself. A challenge that will test your mettle. Spirit also suggests the quality of temperance, enabling one to hold one's own. Did y'all hear what I said? Courage is the ability for one to hold his own or keep up one's morale when opposed or threatened. An example of that is his spirit was unbroken because he failed. I'm talking about courage. Ah, What is the definition of testosterone, Wilson? Well, I'm glad you asked. Testosterone is a hormone that is hydroxysteroid ketone. Hydroxysteroid ketone, which is C C19, H28, and O2. What am I talking about? Well, allow your minds to go back. And let's look at the periodic table of elements. Here we find 19 parts carbon, 28 parts hydrogen, and 2 parts oxygen. I'm talking about testosterone. My God, I feel my testosterone rising right now. Well, testosterone, listen to the definition according to Merriam-Webster. It is produced especially every dyke, every lesbian, every wannabe, every knockoff. Testosterone is produced especially by the testes. Take your hand and just say, your testes. Hallelujah. Or they determine that they can synthetically to put it together. So if there's any of us that time has robbed us of some of our testosterone, God allowed man to come up with synthetic methods so that you can take a little testosterone to help level things out. I can't get no help in here. I'm talking about testosterone. Ah, the testosterone is responsible for inducing and maintaining a male's secondary sex character. Ah, well, what is the definition of a testy, Wilson? Well, the definition of testes is a typically paired, paired, hallelujah, paired male reproductive gland that produces sperm and secretes testosterone. And that in most common mammals is contained within the scrotum, hallelujah, at sexual maturity. Aren't you glad to be a man? Man up! I'm talking about testosterone. Hallelujah. So, brother preacher, Anthony, if you were to combine the definition of courage, on one hand, if I take courage and I combine it with the definition of testosterone, and I was to use it in a sentence, it would read something like this. Stephen was a man with testicular fortitude. I'm talking about Stephen and each every one of us in here. We're men with testicular fortitude. 
Where the knockoffs that? She can walk with her hair cut low. She can put on man's pants and man's clothes, but she will never, never be a man. Testicular fortitude. I'm going somewhere. I'm painting the picture. Wow, courage is important. Testosterone is important. We have to have the Holy Ghost. Do I have any Stevens in here on today? While it is indeed noble and natural, dare I say appropriate to have courage, appropriate to have testosterone, my brothers in conjunction with these things, it is imperative and important that we have what Stephen had also, which is the Holy Ghost. Well, I... On yesterday, Bishop Wooden did an awesome job yes. preaching and teaching. I love listening to my pastor yeah. preach and teach. Yeah. Yeah. As God gifted him and allowed the scriptures to come live in his face, in God's grace and mercy, he allows while he's preaching. Uh -huh. I can almost see the dirt yeah. on the journey in the yeah. road. All right. All right. I can almost see the scriptures come to life yeah. Yeah. right before me. I rejoice in that anointing and gifting in our bishop. Well, while he was preaching, I said, God, I don't know whether to rejoice or to be sad. I rejoice, and then I got a little sad. One thing is clear. There's one leader. One leader. Bishop Wooden. I can't preach like him. Can't teach like him. And I'm glad y'all filled in the blank because I was coming for you too. Neither can you. We can't do it. So my sadness came because line upon line, precept upon precept, I watched him walk through the scripture. I leaned over to Elder Jerome King, the real Dr. King, I call him. And I said, Dr. King, I am excited because I don't know what to do. I pulled my phone out and I opened it up. I said, look at what God gave me. Everything he started to teach on. God allowed me to walk in lockstep with my leader. God Almighty. Yes, sir. Chief of Staff saw me. So while I was rejoicing, because let me tell you something. Every man of God wants to be in the same vein as our spiritual leader. The Holy Ghost will make sure that happens. But if you're prayed up and you have your own clandestine efforts afoot, you won't walk in lockstep. But if you are, the Holy Spirit will ensure they're all. Synergy is there. And you'll see God manifest and get the victory. So I won't go deep into it, but... Our leader talked about, while I talk about the Holy Ghost, it's important to establish the deity of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at Matthew 28, 19, shall we? Hallelujah. Matthew, Matthew, Matthew 28, 19. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 28, 19 reads, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's start at 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power. He too had testicular fortitude. Jesus was a man. Don't let nobody tell you nothing different. I know they're trying to, they're trying to rob us of our masculinity, but Jesus Christ was a man. A real man. Not some weak thing that's been painted in a portrait by some white man. No, no, no. He was a carpenter. Have you done any work with your hands? If you've done any work, you understand that he was a man's man. Picked up work, picked up lumber, understood there was calluses on his hand. He was a man's man. Uh, Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Verse 19 said, go ye therefore and teach all nations. We're talking about the great commission here, boys baptizing them in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and of the name of the 
Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Here we see the Trinity being manifested. The Trinity being talked about. The Trinity, my brothers and sisters, designates one eternal God, yet existing in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. There is no shortage of biblical evidence for the deity of the Holy Ghost. He is spoken of in Scripture as God. The attributes of God are assigned to the Holy Ghost. He is engaged in the works of God, and he receives the same honor due only to God. I'm talking about the Trinity here. My brothers and sisters, from the beginning, ha, huh, and when I say in the beginning, there's two that I'm going to touch on. In the beginning, from a chronos perspective, in time, let's take a look at Genesis 1 and 1. Ah, uh, Genesis 1 and 1 reads, in the beginning, God created. And when we say created, he's talking about the completed universe. Ah, uh, created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was or became, as we all learn, without form and void. That wasn't in my notes. I told you the man of God is only one that can teach you some things. The earth became, hallelujah, without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. I'm here to let you know that courage nor testosterone could move upon the face of the deep. I'm trying to explain to you why we need the Holy Ghost. There's nothing wrong with courage and testosterone, but courage and testosterone couldn't go over the face of the deep. If it happened, nothing would happen, but the face of the Holy Ghost moved upon the face of the deep. Now, I talked about in Kronos, in time. Let's talk about the other beginning. Look at your neighbor and say the other beginning. The other beginning, which is before time. Let's go to John 1 and 1, shall we? Let's allow the scriptures to tell us and teach us. Hallelujah. John 1 and 1 is clear for us, brothers. Oh, thank you, Holy Ghost. God. John 1 and 1 said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, I love this in the text because it says, In the beginning was the Word. And the word was with God. I want you to remember this and write this note down. With God means equal to or alongside. And I'm going to deal with what that means to be alongside God. And the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Oh, my brothers, I want you to know that the Holy Ghost's first reference is here in Genesis 1 and 26. And God made the declaration. Let's look at Genesis 1 and 26. Because there's a reference to the Holy Ghost in Genesis 1 and 26 that I love. Uh, it's the reference, it was the sixth day that this took place. And on the sixth day in 1 and 26, and he said, And God said, let us make man in our image after the likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish and of the sea. Let us, the Holy Spirit, is first reference in Genesis 1 and 26. Now, I need everyone to understand that God is an intentional God. The God of the Bible is intentional in everything he does and says. Let's look at Luke to see if there's any truth in this. Let's look at Luke 24. Hallelujah. Luke 24. Thank you, Jesus. Luke 24 and 49 reads. Let's start at 46. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day. And the repentance, and that repentance, and remission of sin, should be preached in his name among all nations, being at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. Verse 49, and behold, I send the promise. God sends us a promise, gentlemen of my father upon you. I told you God was intentional. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be indu, submerged, saturated with the power from on high. My brothers and sisters, I need you to understand 
that God in his infinite wisdom saw fit to provide a source for us. God in his infinite wisdom said you're going to need something. Here is the source of our strength for effective evangelism. The promise of my father stresses that the spirit's coming is not an afterthought, but an integral part of God's eternal will. God designed it in such a manner he saw before time, knowing that we would need the Holy Spirit. Let's look at Acts 16 and 7. It is imperative that we are all led by the Holy Spirit. Look at your neighbor and say, led by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Acts 16 and 7. Hallelujah. Acts 16 and 7. And it says, and it says, after they were come to Mysia, they assayed to go into Bethany. I should have had you, Elder Cooper, read this. But the Spirit suffered them not. God will guide and tell you when to go and when not to go. You heard in the sit-down session, Bishop Wooden shared testimony. And if time permitted, all of us would have the opportunity to share how God, the Holy Spirit, would tell us, don't do this. Now, I can't say with 100% assurity that every time the Holy Spirit spoke, that Anthony Wilson listened. This is why fasting is important. The flesh will constantly war against the spirit. We have to realize, ah, the Holy Spirit has told me going, coming home. I've been, some was frustrating me, my wife, and I said, Lord, I'm going, I've had it. Now I'm going, when I get home, I'm going to tell her. The Holy Spirit said, shut up. Just go on into the house. But oh no, testosterone rose up in me. Huh? I said, I will go in here. And I was foolish for not listening to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will help you now. Now the whole night is ruined. Look at me by myself. Lonely. That ain't the will of God. Because I have testicular fortitude. God knew I needed her. I can't get no help in here. I'm moving on. I'm moving on. Time is working against me. But I want to tell you, it's important, my brothers, that with the Holy Spirit, there is a manifestation of the Holy Ghost. It is imperative that there be signs and wonders. Mark 16, 16 and 17 says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth shall not, believeth not, shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. I'm here to let you know if you have the Holy Ghost abiding in you, you're going to see that fruit, superintendent. There's got to be fruit. And people is running around saying, don't judge, you can't judge. The devil is a liar. The scripture says, judge not lest ye be judged. That means the same measure. Hold yourself accountable to that. Instead, why don't we just deem ourselves as fruit inspectors? I'm going to inspect that fruit and tell that that fruit's a bit too soft. Too much sugar in it. Man, fix your broken wrist. That's what I'm inspecting in you. The fruit of that man tells me that he's a Dunkin' Donut, a Twinkie from Hostess. He ain't no real man. God, the Holy Ghost, will allow you to see that. Uh, God is our source. The Holy Spirit is the active part of the Godhead, which is the Holy Ghost. And we can do nothing in and of ourselves. Oftentimes, men struggle when they see this manifestation, the power and the glory of God, because we can't lay down our courage. Oftentimes, we struggle to tell self to lay down and die. Uh, but we need God, and we need to lay down our testosterone and upgrade to the true source, which is the Holy Ghost. Look at your brother and say, real men want the Holy Ghost. When you have the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost will pick you up when you're down. The Holy Ghost will strengthen you when you're weak. The God of the Bible in his infinite wisdom recognized after his early ministry was complete that we would be ill-equipped for this earthly journey. It was not what the disciples wanted, 
but it was what the disciples needed. John 14 says in 15 and 18, if you love me, keep my commandment and I will pray the father and he shall give you another comforter. He that he may abide with you forever. Uh, Pastor Parker, if it's in you, it'll be there forever. Even the spirit of truth when the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him from he that dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you, listen to Jesus, uh, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you again. My brothers, I want you to know to be a candidate for Jesus' promise. There's some expectations that we must uphold. One, first and foremost, we must be saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Second of all, it is important as we love Jesus, we have to keep his commandments. Jesus introduces us to the paraclete in verse 16. Now the Greek word for parakletos, it literally means one called alongside. Remember earlier I told you to remember that, alongside to help you. Hence the idea of a comforter. Another is powerful in this text. It stresses that the Holy Ghost would be another like Jesus, or the perfect replacement, rather, for Jesus during his earthly journey. The Holy Spirit is called another comforter because this is also one of Christ's title. In John, 1 John 2 and 1, read that as a translation of the advocate. Now, I'm getting ready to get on out of here. I need you to understand a few things. The Holy Ghost will yield some things in you. Let's go back to Acts 6 and 8. The Holy Ghost will yield some things in you, meaning you don't have to say it, but someone else is going to see it. Acts 6 and 8, talking about our boy Stephen again. In 6 and 8, he says, and Stephen, full of faith and power. What did he do? He did great wonders and miracles among the people. When you are half filled with the Holy Ghost, great wonders will follow you. Miracles will follow you. I'm here to let you know it is imperative that we be filled with the Holy Ghost. What is your source? Are you leading to your education? Are you leaning on your expertise? Are you trying to lean on your gifts? I'm here to let you know on this morning that your gifts and strengths can only take you so far. You must have the Holy Ghost. So you've got to be connected. Connected to what, Elder Wilson? You've got to be connected to the true vine. Look at your brother and say, stay connected. The branch is connected to the tree, the source, versus one that has been disconnected or cut off from the source. When you get time, look at John 15, 1 through 7. Are these my words that I'm telling you, or does the Bible say the same? No doubt the Bible says the same. 15, 1 says, I am the true vine. And my father is the husbandman. Every branch that is in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. He purges. And every branch that beareth fruit, he, excuse me, cuts off, he purges it. That is, it brings forth more fruit. There's a difference between being cut off and purging. It's important to understand if you've been cut off, you're no longer a part of the serve, of the source. But if you're being purged, you're being trimmed back. You're being clipped. How many of you have ever looked at a crepe myrtle? You cut off pieces of it. You don't mess with the trunk, but you cut off pieces of it. It looks like the tree is bald, but just wait a little while. Next time you drive back around, that crepe myrtle is full and blooming. That's what God wants to do in us. God wants to be able to do some trimming and purging. But I'm going to go down to verse 7, and he says, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. When the God of the Bible is your source, when he's your helper, when he's your advocate and your comforter, and you will be filled with the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit abides in you, you will be able to ask what you will. You'll be able to do just like Stephen did. What are you talking about, Reverend? Well, let's go take a look back in Acts. Here we find, as I told you, we find Stephen being arrested. In chapter 6, verse 8, he was falsely accused. He was accused of blasphemy, blasphemy against Moses, blasphemy against the law. 
So here they are. The elders got stirred up and they brought him in before the council. And they said he, and he set up fault witness, according to verse 13, which spake, these men cease not to speak the blasphemous words against the holy place and the law. Verse 14, for we have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place. But look at verse 15. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw Stephen's face as it had been the face of an angel. Ah, when you got the Holy Ghost, people will see the manifestation. They then charged him. But verse 7 came along. After they charged him, they said, Then say the high priest, Are these things so? Stephen, is it true what they're saying? Are you guilty of blasphemy? And he said, Men and brethren, this is Stephen talking. He was respectful. In the face of your enemies, gentlemen, the Holy Ghost will allow you to be respectful. And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken, the God of glory appeared unto our fathers, Abraham. Oh, Stephen took him on a history lesson. He walked through the scriptures all through from chapter 7 up and down telling them. And guess what? They were all shaking their head. That's right, preacher. You talking truth. You telling truth. And then after all that took place, Stephen waiting patiently, full of courage, full of testosterone. He did what was necessary to get their buy-in. But then you look at verse 51. Then he blows them up, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart. I told you, courage will allow it to rise up in the face of adversary. You've got the courage of your convictions to say what needs to be said. You, you uncircumcised in heart and in ear. You do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did also. Which are of the prophets have you not your fathers persecuted? All of you have persecuted someone, and they have slain them which show before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. Oh, when he told them that, he said, who have received the law by the dispos disposition of angels and have not kept it? Once he said that to them, the Negroes lost their mind. They were picked off and said, oh, you gonna talk that noise to us? With his bad self, full of testosterone, Elder Cooper, full of courage, he checked them. And after he checked them, they rose up with gnashing of the teeth. They begin to grind their teeth. And they said, oh, we're going to kill this Negro right here. He's popping off at the lip. He won't stop preaching about Jesus. Well, I know of a local man who can't stop, won't stop preaching about Jesus. Everywhere he goes, people want to know who he's talking about. Bishop Wooden travels the length and breadth of this country, much like Stephen, calling a spade a spade, speaking truth to power under the unction of the Holy Spirit. Well, after they was filled with anger, they began to stone the man of God. Now, it wasn't legal what they were doing, so they had to drag him into the streets of the city. And so they pulled him out so they could stone him. And as they stoned Stephen for preaching the gospel, because he was full of the Holy Ghost. Stephen didn't get upset. Stephen, full of the Holy Ghost, didn't start cussing at him. Stephen, under the Holy Ghost, maintained his dignity. He saw that a suffering way is God's way. He recognized in this Christian journey, we are going to fall into diverse temptations. We're going to fall into situations where the opposition wants to destroy us. But what is the courage of your convictions? Well, it goes on in verse 55. is powerful. But he, Stephen, back at our text, being full of the Holy Ghost, he looked into the hills. He looked up to heaven steadfastly. Understand what's going on the gravity. He's being stoned and beaten. 
but he's looking up to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. God Almighty, when you're going through situations, keep your eyes, stop looking at the situation and put your eyes steadfastly yes, yes, on our Savior. With his eyes lifted, he behold and steadfastly look into the heaven and he saw the glory of God. And he saw Jesus standing. Some say standing in appreciation and applauding how this man of God stood. And 56 says, and he said, behold, I see the heavens open. And the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice. I'm talking about those that were persecuting him and stoning him. And stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. They couldn't handle continuing to see the glory of God be manifested. My brothers, I'm here to tell you when the glory of God is being manifested, there's nothing anyone can do. But you need to also understand that the Holy Ghost will draw not just the good, but the evil. Individuals are going to rise up against you because of the Holy Ghost. We have to have courage in the face of adversity. When you stand on what you believe, you have to have courage. And as he stood there, I found it to be powerful. As they cried out and they jumped on him on one accord, verse 58 says, and he cast him out the city, like I said. Hallelujah. And guess who was standing there? One of them that was persecuting him. There was one that was the head honcho who persecuted the saints. Saul was standing there. I need you to know sometimes when you go through situations, it's not always about you. The great Paul was born out of this situation. God Almighty, and what a mighty voice for Christ Paul became. And he received, verse 59 says, and they stoned Stephen. And Stephen calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and he cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not their sins to their charge, this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. When studying this text, I couldn't help, but my mind went to Luke 23 and 34. The likeness when you align yourself with Jesus Christ. You walk like Jesus. You talk like Jesus. You behave like Jesus when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Is this Anthony's interpretation? No, it isn't. Look at Luke 23 and 34 at your leisure. It says, then said Jesus after the crucifixion. Jesus said, Father... Forgive them, for they know not what they do. In the midst of being crucified, Jesus Christ used these words. And here we find Stephen saying the same. And then look at the correlation on verse 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, talking about our Lord and Savior, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Here we find the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior. And I cannot help but see the similarities in how Stephen, who was full of the Holy Spirit, was a reflection of Jesus Christ. We too can be the reflection of Jesus Christ if we allow the Holy Spirit to indwell us. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will govern every part of your life not on Sunday only not on Thursday night only not only when you're teaching as Bishop said not when you're studying the Holy Ghost will govern every part of your life the Holy Ghost is our foundation gentlemen we are men in NC third that choose to make the Holy Ghost our foundation we recognize that the most important part of any building any structure any temple is the foundation. The Church of God in Christ recognizes that God's 
intentions with regards to the Holy Ghost. They saw it and saw it in such a manner that it became a part of our affirmation, a part of our very statement of faith. It says we believe the Bible to be the inspired and only written word of God. We believe that there is one God eternally existent in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. We believe that the regeneration by the Holy Ghost is absolutely essential for personal salvation. We believe that the baptism in the Holy Ghost, according to Acts 2 and 4, is given to the believers who ask for it. We have to ask for it, gentlemen. Lift your hands and ask God to fill me again. Fill us, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Saturate us in your Holy Spirit, Lord. Endow us, O oh God. We believe in the sanctifying power of the Holy Ghost. By whose indwelling? Hallelujah. By whose indwelling? The Christian is enabled to live a holy and separated life in this present world. Gentlemen, let us take heed to the direction of our bishop. He has pointed us to the Holy Spirit. Let us recognize the sensitivity and the urgency from our man of God. Hallelujah. Yes, Holy Ghost. And I'm closing. When you have the Holy Ghost in you, gentlemen, the Holy Ghost will govern what you say. There's some etiquettes that are only reserved, thank you, Holy Spirit, for the man of God only. There's some courtesies reserved only for him. I know I'm speaking to ones that already know, but it's important to know that we only stand for one man in honoring him, and that's Bishop Wooden. The Holy Spirit will help you understand that. Why we love Mother Beverly DeJanae, there's only one leader in this jurisdiction. Speak, Holy Ghost. We honor her and respect her, but she is not equal with the man of God. We reserve some things for him. This is my spiritual father. Y'all heard me say it. I have a wonderful earthly natural father. Retired command sergeant major, a man's man. But let me tell you something about this man. While I gave my life to Christ when I was young, I wasn't sanctified. It was this man of God that taught me righteousness. I'm indebted to him. The Holy Ghost will allow you to submit yourself. That's not in my notes, but the Holy Ghost begin to speak. Let us continue this. And to teach others this. This isn't the whole body. So if you see somebody doing something that we know not, where is your testicular fortitude? Where is the courage? He needs all of us to be a representative and an extension of who he is. To say, I appreciate what you're doing, but we reserve that only for the leader. That's how you help the house. That's how we help our leader. Kind Father, in the name of Jesus, we say thank you. God, I thank you for everything that we've heard and seen on today. God, I was obedient unto the Holy Spirit. God, I pray that you endow every man in here with the Holy Ghost. God, let us seek your face the more. Let it become routine, necessary that when we rise, when we walk throughout our day, when we go to sleep, that we are praying and calling out, asking you, O oh God, to be a lamp unto our feet and that light unto our pathway. Direct our ways, O oh God. Keep our tongue, Lord Jesus. Give us power from on high. Hallelujah. God Almighty. God endow us with that dunamis power. Have thine own way in us. Have thine own way in us, O oh Lord. And we'll be careful to give you the glory, honor, and the praise. The men of God lifting their hands all over, saying thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Ghost.
In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, clap your hands for Jesus. Give God the praise.